This is the GTC Traders Podcast. The markets, finance, the economy, and commentary. Nothing within this podcast should be viewed as an investing or trading recommendation. GTC Traders is not a registered investment advisor or advisory service. It does not tell or suggest which securities or derivatives should be bought or sold. Analysts, affiliates, employees, or partners of GTC Traders may hold long or short positions within the currencies, derivatives, securities, equities, or industries herein discussed. GTC Traders and Secundus Puer LLC assumes no responsibility or liability for any trading or investing results. Facts, statements, data, and charts posted to the company website or mentioned within this podcast may unintentionally include inaccuracies. Content is for educational purposes only, and outside independent advice should be sought to confirm the validity or accuracy of any statement or claim made. You should ask the firm with which you invest, trade, or deal about the specific terms, conditions, tax implications, and risks of specific markets, and the associated obligations that such trading may place upon you. You should always check with your licensed financial advisor and tax advisor to determine the suitability of any investment to your individual circumstances. No assumptions should be made in relation to the performance or accuracy of the methods shown. No claims are made as to the success or profitability of any statements made. So how do I say it? Do I say, yes, it is I or yes, it is me? You know, I'm somewhat of a language guy. I should know the answer to that question, right? But no doubt many of you will recognize the sound of my voice. Uh, Very briefly here in the introduction. Uh, I have been very busy. I know I've received many kind notes over the years since I sort of left the public space uh, to pursue more institutional efforts. Uh, I have learned more probably in the last five years than I had in the previous ten um, it, it just learned an incredible amount in the last five years. One thing I did notice is that while I did work with uh, a partner that, and, and actually various partners, but one partner in particular that I learned an incredible amount from, just it, it sort of changed the way I look at many, many things. I'm very indebted to him. Um, at the same time, even though, and we interacted constantly uh, in the development of certain projects, one thing I noticed is not being in the public space, not enunciating my thoughts uh, when it comes to markets, when it comes to macroeconomics, when it comes to trading. Uh, one thing I noticed is uh, something I believe that Danny Riley has talked about and others, that if you're by yourself too much, you, you, if you're not interacting with others, well, there, there's an old proverb, right, that says, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the face of another man. In other words, I- interaction with other people makes you sharp, makes you strong, makes you, you know, you, you have to uh, put your ideas out there. You have to defend them somewhat. You can't get into that too much in social media or you'll drive yourself absolutely crazy. Uh, but it, it makes you think more deeply about how you want to enunciate what you're thinking, which actually crystallizes your entire thought process. And if there's one thing I've lo- noticed in the last, what is it, five, six years now, is I, I have not had that. And it's been very noticeable to me. And here, uh, now that we have launched uh, this particular project, and now, with what I have learned, <laughs> we've, I've, I've got a way that I'm doing this with partners that, uh, how do I want to say this? Um, just from a corporate structure standpoint, is just so much more solid. Uh, you look at the, the single family office structure, right? Uh, there's the way that structure set up can offer many, many protections. Many protections. And so uh, we set something up here, and I'm having another go at it. All right? I'm having another go at it. And uh, hopefully this will help. I, one's always said that, that when I shared my thought processes, it, it, uh, they enjoyed it. And I know primarily I'm doing this for selfish reasons. <laughs> it helps me tremendously. And I thought we would begin with something that's been in the news lately. 
for this first podcast of GTC Traders. Uh, by the way, for this podcast, um, something we would like to do as partners we've talked about is not only podcasts where I enunciate my thoughts, uh, others can, can do the same and enunciate their thoughts, put them into a podcast form uh, from, from the company, but uh, interviews as well. There's, there's some folks I've put some feelers out to that I would like to interview. Uh, if you know me, you and I have not said something to you, you may be one of those people I would like to interview. So uh, I've met a lot of good people over the last five years. So, uh, yeah, a lot on the way. But I, I thought I would begin discussing something that's been in my, uh, that, that's been sort of in the popular, uh, what would you say, paradigm of discussion when it comes to markets. And it's about tools. Okay. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I would, as most little boys do, <laughs> play with dad's tools, which usually involved me breaking dad's tools. Uh, my poor, poor dad. <laughs> he has since passed. Um, I miss him. Uh, but he loved his tools. My dad was a, a, a real wrencher. Uh, when, you know, he had to be taken care of on a more professional basis. So, you know, he had gotten to an age where, where everybody had met and agreed as a family uh, that he had to be taken care of on a more professional basis. There was an estate sale, at which point we had to sell his tools. I'll tell you what, people descended on his tools like vultures surrounding an elephant carcass. And there was that much to it. Uh, I guess before I was born, um, this is going back to the 1960s, uh, the family actually has, an, uh, has a, um, a newspaper article uh, down from the area where my family's from. And there was nearly, I, I forget the number, but it was like, this is the 60s and something like, like $25,000 worth of tools stolen from my dad's garage. He had his own garage, right? That's the 1960s. So when I say that my dad was a real wrencher, I am telling you my dad knew how to wrench. Right? He, he, that was just his thing. It's what he loved to do. I remember one time he and I, I must have been 17, 18 years old, maybe 18 years old, and we were rebuilding an engine. So I'd bought a car, turned out to be a bit of a dud, and he said, nah, that's no problem, we'll rebuild the engine. And he told me that it's like if there was one thing that he wished he could have just done for a living was that just rebuilding engines but I, i'm i'm being nostalgic here i'm talking about my dad and and time's gone by the, the the point is i was a little boy messing around in my dad's massive garage and i try to figure his tools out and we discovered my skill my skill was breaking every tool my dad had that i touched you know, jump on the shovel several times, break the stem connector. I, I smashed blades on lawnmowers to bits. I mean, you name it. You is like, yeah. I wonder if I put this thing in a in a vice and just start just start bending on it. What will happen? My dad would walk in, and he'd just be so angry. And at first, you know, just, there was just, was just so much exasperation on my dad's part. But I think finally he just came to. Except that that was sort of my purpose in life. My purpose in life was to break his tools. Uh, in the in the in the end, I'd like to think maybe it helped Dad understand that that uh, he had good tough tools if they could survive me. <laughs> it could take the punishment I could hand out. Hey, yeah, it's a good tool. How do you know? Well, you know, my son couldn't destroy it, so hey, it's got to be a good tool. Now. What was frustrating to my dad, um, I, I think is true. With a new tool, at times you have to play with it. You have to test its limits. You have to push it and see what it can do. Lately, that is what I have been doing with artificial intelligence and various artificial intelligence. What do we call them? Do we call them agents, modules? Uh, you know, this, is, this has been in the hubbub in the news as of late. And it's definitely making an impact. Now, I want to begin by saying I am no artificial intelligence expert. My coding skills, and I'm talking about like sitting down to actually code, are limited to like 1984 Commodore 64 basic 
at best. <laughs> I'm a Gen Xer, right? I know subroutines, I know loops, I know command structures, and that's about where my coding knowledge ends. Um, I have familiarized myself, however, over the years with a base underlying base understanding or you know underlying knowledge of the capabilities of basic code. Somewhat in the professional sphere, I had to do that. I was the very first actually um, technical support on an administrative level for the executives right so the people that the executives interacted with and actually the very first person on site for General Motors World Headquarters at the Renaissance Center in Detroit they moved me from um, I was sort of like a liaison right uh, for the executives because well, I'll just be honest, I ain't working there no more, and the company is no longer around that we that uh, work to support them. Um, they were babies. The executives were children, and they needed hand-holding, and they needed somebody that understood the code and understood what the problem was, but was professional enough to deal with uh, management at world headquarters, right? So that was sort of my thing. So in order to talk with either the server guys or anybody the guys uh, putting new applications on the servers, at the time, I had to have some knowledge, right? So it's not just, hey, I remember Commodore 64 and subroutines. No, actually, I did have to know, have some knowledge of the apps, you know, and integrating them in a model office structure and then, you know, deploying them live and everything that was involved. So I do have some understanding. That is all simply to say I do have some understanding of uh, the capabilities of code and uh, the problems of getting a computer to solve a problem, right? Now, apps are different, right? Applications that we all use every day, that's just, it's simple instructions that are more sophisticated than, are, you know, are a little more sophisticated. There, it's, it's like saying, it's like giving something algebra over and over again and giving a computer, you know, tell, asking a computer to solve a, a difficult algebra problem. Uh, very instruction-based. It can do it. It's just algebra. It's not rocket science, you know, that's apps, right? You know, so artificial intelligence is on a whole other scale. I will say this, I, I've been, I've been playing with it. Um, and I, and I'm going to get to my thoughts as to how I think it's going to impact markets, or at least I can't, you, anybody that's known me for a while knows I, I have no idea how it's going to impact markets and nobody knows how it's going to impact markets, but what I'm on the lookout for. What are the questions that I have in my mind at the moment, right? Th th that's probably a better way to put it than I predict ABC. Well, yeah, whoopee, good for you. Nobody knows, like, predictions are like noses. Everybody's got one. Who cares? You can't predict the future. It's a scientific law and fact. But in having played with this tool, as I would play with dad's tools, and I would try and break them, I have worked with artificial intelligence as a tool to try to figure it out. And I'll say this, if you think that artificial intelligence is just better apps, you're sorely mistaken. It is so far beyond that. It is an attempt to model the way human beings think and reason with none of our filters. Our consciousness has filters, right? So that we experience life in a, at a certain pace. We, you know, the, well, just the pace that we experience life. And, you know, uh, what artificial intelligence is trying to do is mimic the... There, there's there's many pieces to it, folks. There's many, many pieces to it. I'll, I'll get into just a couple of the pieces of it here. But uh, the, the methods and mechanisms which allow us to reason. Now, here's what's interesting. We've known about some of these mechanisms for a long time and what those problems are. We just didn't have the processing power that could solve the problem. Our minds are absolute, our brain, the human brain has been called the most complex structure in the known universe. Have you ever heard that statistic, uh, we only use 10% of our brain? Uh, that's so misleading on so many levels when you start 
doing research on it, you use your whole brain. However, it is noted that the storage capacity of the human mind, like what it'll begin to do is it just branch and branch and branch. And if it could continue to do that, it, uh, to store information the way it stores information, begins to store information and branch out and then re, you know, make new connections and reestablish old connections and then make brand new connections that will branch and then loop in on the whole thing, uh, it's sort of been said to mimic a multi-dimensional structure. Uh, it becomes so, so, so complex. Uh, I say that to say that if our brains continue to store information the way it begins to expand upon itself and store information, the storage capability of our brains is almost limitless. Like, like if a human being could actually live forever, the mechanism by which a human mind stores data and then will almost cre create new pathways to store new data and then bend back in on itself, it's almost infinite. Uh, but you, you use your whole brain, okay? <laughs> right? When you're going around the day, it's not like, hey, you know, only 3% of your brain's turned on. <laughs> no, no, you're using your whole mind. <laughs> Uh, much of our storage capacity, we just we, we don't even begin to approach the, the capability of that. I say that to say this. The, from what I've read, right, when I read something by a biochemist, or, uh, is that the human brain is one of the most complex structures known to exist anywhere in the universe. And we don't know how it works completely. But its processing power for what it the information that it processes is unbelievable. So we've known like I'm going to give you an example here in a second of a problem that a computer could never solve before, and we've known what is needed to solve that problem, but we didn't have the processing power that could do it until now. So I'm going to give you an example just how much different artificial intelligence is in just one aspect than just simple code, right? Python or something. Um, it's a metaphor. I've heard it referred this way, and I've always referred to it as the B8 problem. I've heard others refer to it as the B8 problem as well. If you're familiar with the B8 problem, then you already know where I'm going. Uh, I'm going to give you a little experiment. So if you have a scrap piece of paper, right? So if you have a piece of paper and a pen handy, Here's what I want you to do. Handwritten. Don't type it. If you type it, it won't work. Handwrite a B. And then what I want you to do next to that B, so capital B, like B, B is in bat, right? So handwrite a B. And then next to that, on your scrap of paper that I asked you to get out, handwrite an 8. Now, how do you tell a B from an 8? Well, you say, it's simple, man. I, I'm looking at it. I, I know how. Right, one's a B and one's an 8. I just wrote it. Okay. But how do you think and reason how to differentiate between a B and an 8? The number 8. What is the mechanism in your mind that you are facilitating to do this? I don't know what you're talking about, man. Well, I'm going to describe the B8 problem to you and the way uh, it's sort of been worked and why we have not had the processing power capable of solving the B8 problem. Now we do. Uh, and we actually, we've, we've been able to solve the B8 problem for a while, but this is, I'm just using this as a metaphor to explain artificial intelligence. Uh, one way, and there are a few ways, you don't realize this, uh, but your mind, your little three-pound piece of gray matter, has unbelievable databases built upon databases upon databases that you don't even know are there. Uh, I would suggest, if you can stand it, I I'm going to suggest a podcast. It's a little bit aggravating to listen to. <laughs> and no disrespect to either party. I think both are brilliant people. But there was a um, podcast that Dr. Peterson had with Temple Grandin, who is 
uh, highly autistic. Is she a doctor? I don't know if she has her doctorate, but she's completed so many courses and, and just accomplished so much as a highly autistic person. The podcast can be a little difficult to listen to. All due proper respect to both people. I think both of them are absolutely brilliant. Um, but one is a highly verbose person that would not stop talking <laughs> and let her finish her statement. Listen to what she was saying. I love you to death, but you wouldn't. And uh, the other person, the, uh, Temple Grandin, is is highly autistic, so is a visual thinker. But it was it so it can be a little bit frustrating because the the highly verbose person is interrupting the the person I wanted to listen to the the highly autistic speaker and it was like I don't care I I've listened to fourteen of your podcasts I know what you think let her talk <laughs> but uh, she did and it, it is a good podcast um, but it, she spoke about the way she thought and what she was describing is visual databases in her mind. And that's the way she sifted information. And she was trying to describe how a highly visual autistic, you know, uh, thinker, I forget her exact terminology, was it an object, visual thinker, sees the world and remembers and processes information. It's fascinating to listen to. And she has solved so many problems uh, in industry because her skills, her specific skills, were realized and and so but my whole point in saying this is all of us have that to some degree not as highly developed and 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 per particularly um leaning in the way that someone like temple grandin does but all of us have these incredibly large databases in our brain that we don't even know is there and within that database every variation of the letter b and the way the letter b as in bat or boy can be written is in your mind. You don't even think about it. And you have an equally large database of every variation that you've ever known, could ever think of, of the number eight that comes after seven. You don't, again, even though you have these databases, we're going to call them databases, but you don't even realize it's there. But it is. Now there's something, uh, how, how do I want to, how do I want to describe this? Uh, so, so think about it this way. Just visualize that in your brain. You hold database and just every variation of a B, as in boy, and there's another database next to it, and it's got every variation of the way the number eight can be written. Now, there's some of those Bs and some of those eights that are a little fuzzy. Like, do I call that an eight or do I call that a B? I don't know. You know what? I'm going to call that an eight. And you don't, you would be hard pressed to, to call it, right? Uh, no, no, I think that one's a B, right? Any of us that have had to read a doctor's writing, you know, has has encountered that that handwriting has encountered that problem. <laughs> like, like, which is that? I'm going to call it this way, right? So those are on the fuzzy edges, but there's stuff in the middle. It's like, no, that is definitely a B, and that is definitely an A. So what we're calling these are bounded variance tables. In other words, your mind, without ever re realizing it, scans through everything it knows about bees, every variation. There's some that are on the edges, but some that are definitely known. That is, without question, a bee. It's at the very center of what is known that is a bee. And then there are things that are very, it's a little more hard for you to tell it's actually a bee. But yeah, we're going to call it, we're going to put it on the looser, bounded variance of what is a bee. And there are examples within this table. These examples are bounded to different variations or a bounded variance table of what is a B. And your brain, your mind, can take that whole process of what is a B and compare it to the entire other database that exists of what is an 8. Two variance tables, compare them, that's a B, that's an 8. Sometimes it's hard because it's a bounded variance table. Sometimes it's a little fuzzy. And very quickly, your conscience will say, oh, that's a B or that's an A. Now, that's just one mechanism that we've known about for a while. Um, there's other ways, that, it, beside bounded variance tables, that your brain knows what's a B and what's an A. Context, you know, uh, there, there's whole other discriminatory methods by which 
your brain knows what is a B and what's an 8. How do you code that is the issue? Well, they figured it out, and it, it takes a bit of processing power to come up with two bounded variance tables and then, then uh, compare them and be able to tell what's a B and what's an 8. They've been able to do that with handwriting, right? When you can handwrite on your tablet and then just transpose it to text. Well, now they know how to do that, but it takes a lot of pro it took a lot of processing power. Well, as processing power has increased, they've added other layers to that. Um, you know, uh, you know, context. You know, eight boys. Okay, well, you can just read eight boys, and it's like, well, that must be an eight because it's talking about a number of boys, and that's definitely O Y S. So, you discriminatory context, right? There's many other methods. The B8 problem is just one method. But the whole issue that I'm trying to get to is there are how do you code these things? And it goes far, far, far and many more mechanisms than just the B8 problem. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I keep on saying the B8 problem. I mean the bounded variance. Using bounded variance as a tool to solve the B8 problem. How do you think? How do you reason? How do you learn? How do you store that? These are all mechanisms like the B8 problem that we've known about. How, you know, okay, well, our, our brains do this and our brains do that. And this is what you would need to do to accomplish that task, to learn, to decide that you have to. How, do you, how does your brain know that you have to learn something else? That you're lacking information. What's, you know, how do you do research? These are things that your mind does without ever knowing, like, the mechanism that it's using to go out and accomplish that task. It just does them. And we have not had to yet. The B8 problem is one of hundreds of methods. The B8 problem took a lot of program, you know, a lot of processing code to figure out how for a computer to... to not, not, not to figure out how to do a B8 problem. We knew there were bounded variance tables, but God, the code it's going to take, right? Well, and we, the processing power it's going to take. Well, as processing power has increased, the B8 problem sort of got, you know, we, yeah, not just, not like figured out, but yeah, now we've got the, the processing power to do bounded variance tables and other discriminatory methods. Stylometry, right? There's, there's many of these methods. B8 is just one metaphor that I'm trying to use that, to show you that what's, what's being shown here and attempted is not just fancy computer code. If you think that's what it is, you're sorely, sorely mistaken. The mechanisms by which human beings think have been known about for a long time. We just couldn't do it. Well, now we can. And these modules or these agents are what I've been playing with. As I said, our, our human minds are absolutely unreal at their, at their storage capability, as well as processing speed. There's no computer that you could have on your desk that could ever... I've heard that a computer on your desk, right, the processing power of the computer on your desk couldn't approach like one one thousandth of the brain capacity of the dumbest ant on this planet uh, now i i want you to reflect on the fact that i used my wording there very carefully first of all i'm talking about your desktop pc okay your desktop PC, and comparing that to the ability, I didn't say processing speed, I said the ability of the dumbest ant. Ants have ob very obviously tiny brains. I actually listened one time to a, a fascinating lecture. It was actually one of our congregations on the capabilities of an ant, right? Um, there's a Actually, a, uh, a Bible proverb that talks about learning from creation and one of the case examples it uses is an ant. And therefore, this lecturer basically uh, sort of gave a lot. It was fascinating. I was, I was sort of just captivated by it. I can remember it, and that's been about 12 years ago, on the capabilities of an ant. Now, very obviously, ants have very, very tiny brains. 
I think there was something like a quarter of a million neurons. However, your desktop PC cannot do artificial intelligence. That's not where, like, if you have your phone, your phone isn't doing <laughs> artificial intelligence, all right? It's referencing back to the cloud, which is referencing back to, okay, an ant has, like I said, if I can remember something, like something around a quarter of a million neurons, which is, like, infinitesimally small. But even with the way that neurons have a, a neural ability to bend back in on one another, they can have, they have problem solving. Uh, they have incredible engineering and problem-solving capabilities. They have social behaviors. That's not something your desktop PC can do, ever, or will ever probably be able to do. I listened to, it was that same lecture that talked about there are some ant colonies where if while trying to work for the entire uh, collective, the ant collective, and one of those ants becomes sick or injured and does not th pose a threat to the group, well, first of all, the surrounding ants will decide, wait a minute, does this guy pose a threat to, to our colony? No? Okay, well, tell you what. We're going to lift him up. We're going to carry him back to our uh, colony. And we've got a special, like, infirmary section set up there. And we're going to take care of this little guy until he gets back on his feet. They'll feed him and take care of him incredible pro humans could learn something from that that was one of the points in this uh, lecture when somebody's obviously sick or well do we sit there and judge them or uh do we do we sort of carry them a little bit maybe see what we can do to help them out i still remember that point but the point is <laughs> the point of this podcast is that ants have with a neural network have an incredible problem solving and engineering capacity that your desktop pc will never have now what can be a little ironic about this is that some features of your desktop pc have helped in the development of ai and what i mean about that is we've all seen these games right or uh i used to play games when i was when i was younger you know all the way from and we'll get into the <laughs> we'll get into me being an old man here in a bit uh <laughs> but yes i remember pong I remember my dad buying us, uh, what was it? It was an Odyssey. It was an Odyssey, right? We didn't have the uh, Atari 2600. My best friend growing up, Stevie, had that. But uh, we had an Odyssey. So it was like, it wasn't Pac-Man. It was like, I forget even Kit Kat or something like that. Crazy. I, I forget the name of the thing. It had a, like a touch screen, like, which wasn't really touch screen. It was just press the, the mat really hard, right? Keyboard thing. Hey, man, Dad was trying to get us the best. It, it didn't turn out that way, but he was trying. Anyways, uh, I go from that all the way into, uh, you know, back in my 20s playing the early MMOs, Star Wars Galaxies and that sort of thing, right? Now, in that, we had, you know, how good is your graphics card? How good is your graphics card? In finance, we don't really need that anymore. The main thing with our graphics card is can it run eight monitors, <laughs> that's the only question we have and that requires power so that's all we care about but there's also for these games that you see that are just so ultra realistic there's a lot of graphics capabilities you know beyond the in the hardware to create those incredible graphics well what they discovered with those gpus is that to do all of those calculations it's like wow we learned how to do it for graphics but you know what it could be used for other things and then there's also, I'm not going to get too much into the hardware here, uh, but there's also something called TPUs, okay? So basically a tensor processing unit or a TPU can be used in conjunction, yes, with CPUs and with, uh, you know, TPU, CPU, and GPUs to uh, do the computational power necessary out on the cloud, so and in, in servers right so but this is all also accelerating every day that passes the the raw computational power as well as the software algorithms by chaining a lot of this stuff together so that's why i said that if you notice i i i phrased that very carefully about the dumbest ant to what you know just the single processing power of your computer on your desk is 
So what they've done is, okay, let's get TPUs, tensor processing unit, and GPUs, and CPUs, create incredibly sophisticated algorithms, chain these suckers together, and see what we can do. And what we can do now is artificial, artificial intelligence, maybe artificial thinking, artificial reasoning. Artificial intelligence is attempting to mimic the thousands of discriminatory algorithms that we have in our mind to think not to have consciousness okay that's a whole metaphysical to uh to borrow from the hebrew you know what is you know the ruach what is what is the breath of life what is that what is consciousness and i think it's a big mistake for everybody i'll get into the anthropomorphication of of ai here in a bit and i think it's silly and when you see people doing, oh, look at what this AI robot said. That's so scary. What are they going to do to us? That's, that's, an, anthropomor- that's an anthropomorphication of basically an algorithm that was set up ahead of time to grab a headline and to distract you from the really interesting things about AI. AI is not consciousness. AI is mimicking the mechanisms by which we think. And... Bounded variance tables are just one method of thousands. And, and years and years ago, they figured out how to, 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 that we had the bu- processing power to basically solve for bounded variance problems. Now they're layering hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of other mechanisms by which we think, like bounded variance, on top of that and integrating them. There is a concept known as singularity AI. When basically... Artificial intelligence will have all of the capabilities of the thinking and reasoning power of a human being, but at a computer speed. So they will be able to not unconscious us, not ruach, not not the breath of life, but AI will be able to outthink us. And it's coming. Some people think it's five years away. So... I, this has all been up to this point to try to stress to you that if you just think it's fancy adaptive code, you're wrong. Uh, I've looked at things like the B8 problem for a long time. Let's let's dump the B8 problem in bounded variance tables. I'm just going to talk about one one particular. Uh, I'm just going to mention this other particular aspect of AI. Right? It, it's there's there's literally hundreds of them. Bounded variance is one of hundreds. There's uh, something known as, and this is something I'm a geek in, so I'm going to try not to geek out too much on you, but there are, there's something known as stylometry. Stylometry is the algorithmic, algorithmic, the algorithms that we create. <laughs> I'm going to have a, I'm going to have an Elmer Fudd moment here. The algorithms, I'll just substitute, do word substitution. By the way, that's a, that's a translation method. Um, substitution. Yeah, anyway. Uh, (laughs) stylometry are algorithms that we create by which you can detect who authored something. Right? I'm going to give you an example. And I'm going to geek out here a little bit, but I'm going to try and tell you it in the terms of a story. Uh, One of my particular specialities that I'm a student of is a science called textual criticism. Textual criticism has to do with how do you know that Julius Caesar wrote the Gallic Wars? How do you know Herodotus wrote the Persian Wars? How do you know that Tacitus wrote the Annals of Imperial Rome? Right? There's many methods. There's many, 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 many methods uh, by which you determine those sort of things. One of the methods, when you have many source materials in a particular, you know, of a particular document that's ancient. So what we're trying to determine is ancient documents, right? Who wrote that? Have you ever heard of the ghost writer of William Shakespeare? Somewhat, a lot of that stuff's nonsense, right? And a lot of the nonsense was born out of a particular gentleman in the 19th century that we laugh at today in in textual critical circles, or at least I laugh at him because his his concept his theories were nonsense. However, we owe him a debt of gratitude because he he began 
the thought process that you could identify an author by the way something was constructed. So some of his thought processes were silly. Ah, wow, you know, uh, eight people wrote this book, and it's it's now no, awesome, that, sorry, no, one person pretty much wrote that book. No, you're being silly, right? The theory is silly now. However, he sparked the idea that you could identify an author by how he wrote. That that theory, that kernel, that almost Unix kernel thought was there. And eventually that came and gave birth to what we refer to as stylometry. In other words, the style and the study of the style of a particular author. I'll give you an example. Um, first one that comes to mind, right, in the Bible. Uh, have you ever heard people say, ah, you don't know what the Bible is. It's been copied so many times. Anybody that says that has a... a how do I be diplomatic here? A ridiculously poor education. Um, we're more sure of how they spelled the word and 4,000 years ago in the Bible than we are that Julius Caesar ever lived at all. Scientifically, forget, throw, throw theology out of it, throw a belief of God out of it. I'm just talking about the science of understanding documents, right? I'm not talking about theology here. I'm talking about the science of understanding what, who wrote a document. So there's a book, there's a selection of books in the Bible uh, that have been attributed to a man named Saul of Tarsus. He also went by the name of the Apostle Paul. He was uh, given the assignment to go uh, preach his gospel of uh, to Gentiles, right? And he wrote a series of letters. And he wrote many, but only a few of his letters are contained with what we call today the Bible. Uh, how do you know Paul wrote certain letters? Well, well, in the beginning of some of his letters, it says, I, Paul. <laughs> okay, well, that's easy enough. But does that prove Paul wrote the Bible or those books of the Bible? No. It doesn't. If you are a Christian, and I'm telling you I'm a Christian, and you read I, Paul, an apostle of the Lord, does that prove that Paul wrote that letter? No, it does not. You have to apply science. You have to apply reason. You have to apply rationality. You can apply the same techniques that you apply to Xenophon or Thucydides to these books. And you can figure out by the style... By the style. Can you even believe this is an investing trading podcast? <laughs> 35 minutes into this. I'm talking to you about stylometry. And, and I won't get into paleographical analysis. But I'm talking to you about stylometry in the Apostle Paul's letters. But it all has to do with AI. You can tell by the style that, that all of these letters were written by a single man. And there's other methods that you can tell, yeah, this man was had a Jewish background. And there are other methods that you can learn uh, to say, yeah, not only did this man have a Jewish background who wrote these letters, uh, you can very definitely tell he lived in the middle of the first century CE. Whoever wrote this, you're not a Christian. Whoever wrote that book, without question, by the science of it, this man lived in the middle of the cent first century CE, and he, without question, was Jewish. Uh, just the way he writes things. Well, also his style of writing. Paul has such a distinctive style. I've studied stylometry for decades. So, like, I mean, I could just read something. And it's like, yep, that's Paul. So there was an argument years and years ago that the Bible book of Hebrews, that wasn't written by Paul because every letter of the book of Paul, by Paul, you know, uh, every book by Paul says, I, Paul, an apostle of, you know, and that's how it begins. And this book doesn't. And it never names the author. So you don't know that Paul wrote that. Well, when you apply the science, the algorithms of the sentence construction, sentence length, the way the conjunctions, especially with Paul. Oh, my God. His conjunction usage after a thesis had been had been written in the previous paragraph. God, Paul just stands out like like a Gen X or using ellipses, like three the three dot thing. Right. I mean, Paul just you can peg that guy's writing so easily scientifically right by using algorithms before we had computer algorithms there were other like algorithms right an algorithm predates computers 
uh, it's just a set of instructions. By, by going through these set of instructions, you can tell, yeah, this is the same writer. You can, you can peg it. I'll give you a little story there. My business partner, right? He's written various uh, articles for, um, oh, in a number of venues. And he wrote, uh, he was a business, he was, I'm, I'm trying to protect you, buddy. Uh, I really am, my friend. How do I say this? Uh, he was a partner in a particular venture, and that's all I'll say about it. Um, and he wrote a splash page for it, right, for this particular business venture. And then he left the company and somebody else added their two cents. And he was showing me, he's like, hey, maybe we can use something I wrote here. And I read it. Uh, actually, how did, how, did you, how did you say that to me? I'm trying to remember. We could use this. And it was something along the lines of, uh, by the way, you, I, that's what it was. You said, by the way, I wrote that. And I was like, dude, you didn't have to tell me you wrote that. I could read it and tell that it was you. Just the, and he's like, really? And I'm like, you're talking to a student of textual criticism, stylometry algorithms, man. It's like I've had, I've had my head buried in those things for like 10 years. It's like, it's like the sentence length, the comma usage, uh, the, the space, like the, the, the way paragraphs are formed or not formed, it, it was you. It was like, you might as well have just written your name, like, from beginning to end. Like, I just peg it. It's, and then somebody else came in and added their two cents, and I could see exactly where, exactly where this other person came in and started writing something. Why? This is all a few stories to tell you. I could tell that by the, by the algorithms of stylometry. And those have been put, now to bring this all back to AI, you can tell, right? The way somebody writes something, you can even try and hide it. And it, you, there's so many algorithms to like, now that we have, that we've been able to code to be able to tell, yeah, you're trying to hide it. That's actually you, <laughs> right? And, and now we had things like going back a little bit, like the book of Hebrews, right? It's known Paul wrote that. I'm sorry, but he did. First of all, just examine it on a stylometry basis. Then we found the Chester Beatty papyri, which I have had the distinct honor and high privilege of uh, at the University of Michigan. I was able to examine the Chester Beatty papyri, not only in the rare papyri exhibit that they put on from time to time, but, and I'm forever indebted to you people, taking me behind the scenes in the back rooms and, and looking at all of those papyri. It was an extreme honor, um, a very spiritual ex experience uh, to be staring at those documents that are that old. Um, but we found the Chester Beatty papyri, and it's all of Paul's letters, and the Book of Romans ends on one page. You can look this up at the Chester Beatty papyri for yourself if you know uh, Kone Greek, but... Uh, which is a it's a form of common Greek that was used in the first century. Uh, the book of Romans ends on like halfway down the page, and the book of Hebrews begins on, like halfway in the page, and it's all of Paul's letters, and like Hebrews is in the middle of it. So, yeah, Paul, Paul stylometry and a million other methods, we know Paul wrote that book. Um, so, that's all a big, long Otello, to borrow a Jar Jar... Bing's phraseology. Uh, that's a big long Otello to say that there are so many algorithms, there's so many processes in language. Stylometry is one of them by which you can tell the style of writing of someone. Now take bounded variance tables, take stylometry, and take a hundred other methods like that of how we learn. And they've all got names, and you compile them. We finally have the processing power to begin to mimic how a human thinks and reasons and solves problems. Not consciousness. Not consciousness. But how to adapt, right? It is not. This has been up to this point to tell you that if you think artificial intelligence is just a fancy computer program, I'm going to say it again. You are sorely, sorely mistaken. So, that's where we're at with artificial intelligence. Um, I've just tried to lead you to this point from my own research to tell you that it is, it is new. 
It's unlike anything we've seen before. You know, we're talking about what is learning and how do humans learn. How do we reason, which means that if you can figure out how to code reasoning ability, you can start talking about humility. Right? And, and things like that. So it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing in its capabilities. So, I, as I said, I have taken to Dad's tools and see if I can break them, see what I can do with them. Because I want to figure out for investing and trading, if I can use this as a tool, how can I use it? And what can I use it to do? And where are its limitations? You shouldn't use a butter knife or somewhere on a flathead screwdriver, right? You're using the wrong tool. If it's a, it's a, if it's a screw, go get a flathead. Or if it's a Phillips head, like go get a Phillips head screwdriver. Don't get a butter knife. So I want to I want to know, just like you don't use a butter knife for a screw, you use a screwdriver. I want to know how to use this tool. So what I've been doing in large language models. First, see you got to understand when it comes to artificial intelligence. From what I've been able to gather at this point, um, something like Chat GPT is just a large language model. So that's only one. There are many, many, many other artificial modules, and these modules can be combined. So I've been having conversations with large language models, AIs. I was trying to break it. <laughs> Dad would be so proud. <laughs> but I wanted to see where its capabilities were. I wanted to, like, I'm getting into the, Oh, like Augustine's and the Alexandrian concept of the Logos and its search for truth. Could that unite various human disciplines of study? Now, I already knew when I began the conversation with this AI what the answer was and why, why I was taking this important fact. I was taking the fact that various human endeavors and human arenas of study have to be differentiated one from the other and I was ignoring that fact. And what I was telling the AI is, no, these are all the same thing. So, in other words, I'm trying to break the tool. I already knew that, no, various disciplines and studies have to be differentiated one from the other. Physics is not science, is not religion, right? I know that, trust me. However, I, what I was trying to do is break it and say, no, it is. So I was trying to get it to agree with several lines of study, you know, several lines. I was basically building a false algebraic logic table. If you don't know what I'm referring to when I say a false algebraic logic table, what I'm referring to is like uh, cows eat grass, grass is green, therefore cows must be green. Right? Naturally, cows must be green. Well, obviously, we all know that's false. But I was building a false algebraic logic table and then trying to argue with the AI to see what it's limitations were and i it's sort of it was sort of cute because it was a large it's a large language model right i was using chat gpt and i was stopping the ai and interrupting it <laughs> so we were like getting into like like this argument this hour-long argument about how um the sort of a, a symbolic concept of the logos could be used to unite various disciplines of study and I would get it to agree to several lines and then ask it to provide references to agree to that line that it had basically agreed to and that that was true and that there was scholarly consensus on. You got to also understand that when these AIs scrape the internet, they, they know not to look at like, you know, the 18 the year old kid with acne in the basement and his blog, they know to ignore that. They, they give preferential treatment to um, authoritative statements scholarly papers wherein there is consensus because you can't even use scholarly papers and i'll get into that here in a second but where is where is there is consensus so i would i was getting it to agree to various facets of a false algebraic logic table and then i was trying to make my point so you see that i can say you know cows are green and it was saying no no those are two different 
and it was arguing with me and i like that it was like okay so you know there's a differentiation and i'm using you can't reason enough chat gpt does not have the capability to reason enough that i was using a false algebraic logic table but that told me something else that it's been hard coded into it and finally i got it to admit that yes the metaphors i was using have been argued and presented it true at the highest academic circles but it was limited by its programming and i was like ha gotcha i broke dad's tool <laughs> right so yes folks we are at that 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 spot in humanity where now we are arguing with our own constructs now i can how do i want to say this i can say i broke it but that's not really true what i was doing is discovering something about the tool the example I use, and I'm not going to go into the complexities of that example again, but the example I use has been debated among scholars. You know, could these disciplines be less differentiated than we once thought? Or should they be? You know, is it all really the same thing? You know, uh, and at a certain level, it's not, right? Humans have decided, now we're going to differentiate them in this manner. And the AI was telling me that at a certain point, the humans are going to have to hard code differentiators into very, very high, high, high level concepts and very high level um, arenas that humans are exploring and questions that humans are asking themselves, which tells me a lot as well. That tells me where those, where those lines of hard coding are at. You know, where, where do they place those lines? That's important for me to know. When am I entering an arena where something may be more hard-coded into the AI? I say I broke it, but what I guess what I really mean is I'm discovering things about it. But I would have several conversations with it about any given topic. And I wasn't even interested in any given topic. What I'm doing, as I said at the beginning, is I'm trying to find the limitations. I'm trying to see what this tool of AI can do, what it's able to do, and when the answers get all fuzzy and weird, and I've been satisfying my own curiosity about how limited AI is, I, I've come to some conclusions. <sighs> certain modules are limited in certain ways. When you begin combining them, it gets scary. They can be very, very adaptive and... The scariest thing is they don't have some of the human fallacies that we do. Like, you know, humans have this propensity to overcomplicate things. AI doesn't. Uh, it's, it, it was fascinating as I was trying to find the limitations, right? So I can find the limitations of, like, chat GPT, but, you know, that's not telling me anything about the self-learning and adaptive AI, right? So I'd go play with that for a while, and I'm trying to break it. Uh, I've, I've come to a lot of conclusions on it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's AI that's, well, let's, let's put it this way. I think it's already being differentiated along socioeconomic lines. In other words, to use the William Gibson metaphor, we have access to the poor man's AI and there's other stuff out there that's ice to, you know, sort of use the William Gibson. It's so far advanced that we it would freak us right the heck out. Something like chat GPT, that's a large language module. So if you're not familiar with AI, all that is is a, it's able to interact with you, scrape the internet for information. It knows to scrape only scholarly sources. And this is something I'm going to get into when we start talking about investing and trading and what I, the impact I think it will have on investing and trading. Um, it knows to, like, ignore, like, you know, I've solved, I've solved quantitative finance with a 20-day stochastic, you know. It knows to ignore that stuff. But I actually went down that rabbit hole with it, and it freaked me the heck out. There, by the way, I'm not sure if people know this, there's a difference in quantitative finance between stochastics and stochastic. Hey, if you know what I just said... Leave a comment on the video or in the podcast comment section. I'm sort of curious if anybody knows what I'm talking about. Like everybody knows in, in finance, right, and in trading, like professionals. We make fun of people who use stochastics. But if you're a real quant guy, like 
uber nerd quant guy, you know exactly what I mean by there's stochastics, and then there's stochastics. Stochastic probability. Oh, I gave you a, gave you a hint. Anyways, yeah, large language AI, right? It's, uh, it's the stuff I had access to, or at least the modules I used. It was interesting. It let me know that um, there's time constraints, right? So I would ask it a question to which I knew there was a very, very, very complicated, in-depth, like, eight-axis answer. And I wanted to see how long it took to answer. Like, I, I, in this particular, and I'm, I've studied so many different faiths and religions around the planet you can't even begin to to comprehend it so i asked it something i knew that was a very very in-depth question and i said okay about this particular religious faith with these particular covenants is there the belief in this faith of xyz and they said no uh there's not and i was like no i said that's actually factually wrong if you do further investigation you will see that the two concepts that I mentioned to you previously are tied to the third concept, which relates to the fourth concept. And that's how that particular faith takes these several covenants and ties them again into a theological whole. And it corrected itself. Oh, I apologize. You are correct. That particular faith does teach X, Y, Z. I was wrong. And again, I thought, ha ha, I broke you. <laughs> but it just taught me there's a time constraint so it wants to get the user an answer in a particular time period so it may do a surface scan which means you shouldn't be relying on it too much you have to realize you have a dumb research assistant with you a really really good one that's ridiculously quick but you have to understand its limitations right it could give you a wrong answer and say no that's not true and you would have to know enough to argue with it. So what it taught me is with ChatGPT, there's a time constraint. When it tries to get you a correct answer, when, when it looks over the surface information, but if it's a very in-depth information, you as the human need to know the complexities and the nuances of that particular material. The AI won't do it for you. And I'll have something to say about that here in a second. So it was insanely helpful when I'm looking for a source. Uh, I did find various reasons, and I tried to test this, and I hope it didn't get saved to my like particular identity online that I'm a bad guy or something. But I was making, I was pushing some like gray areas as far as what's considered socially and politically acceptable, and I noticed that due to either liability or political, you know, politically correct reasons they were turning an exceptionally helpful AI into a glorified Google search. And I do fear for that. So, like, um, we're just talking about large language models. It was exceptionally helpful as a research assistant. More helpful if you understand the complexities. Like, if you have a master's in a particular field of study, Right. Like like I, I know various fields of study to an incredible degree. And so I would say if you have a master's in a particular field of study, which means the human still has to have the education for chat GPT. It is insanely helpful. And you will know if you have that advanced education, how to properly use it. If you don't, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second, you're going to be limited you may get answers that are factually incorrect. Now, I'll have more to say on that. Here's another conclusion I've come to. And I, and I also explored some self, not just large language models like ChatGPT. I haven't tried BARD yet and tried to break it. Like I'm jumping up and down on one of Dad's shovels or putting one of his screwdrivers in a vise and like seeing if it'll hold my weight. <laughs> but I'll get there, BARD. You trust me, I will. Uh, but in examining self-learning modules, I also experimented with modules where they were they were self-learning. It would teach itself something. Those ones freaked me the heck out. I'll tell you that right now. So I, I basically like 
would lose large language, self teaching modules. Here, here are some of my conclusions. Okay, so we're gonna get to we're gonna get to a few more problems I have with AI and what I see people doing and how I see them misunderstanding. Then we're gonna get to some of my conclusions. Uh, I've listened to a, a few presentations on AI. And the people that I could tell instantly, the people that were using it did not know how to use it. And I'm not insulting anybody. I love them to death. I listen to some of these people's podcasts, but it became very evident to me that they weren't using the tool correctly. They were using a butter knife to try to, you know, unscrew something. That's not the proper tool. You know, you have to use the right tool for the right thing. I'll give you an example of that. I'm trying to, I'm sitting here trying to think. Uh, the people who think I'll just have the AI do it are making a massive mistake. And I'm going to, I'm going to go back to like, I'm an old guy, right? I'm 51 now, going to be 52. You, you guys who have known me believe that? I'm going to be 52. Uh, cause some of you guys have known me since my like younger 30s. Uh, <sighs> I saw the same mistake being made when the internet, so me talking, being about an old guy, when the internet first came along, right, um, and became more readily available. And during the dot-com phase, which I remember quite well, uh, people were trying to sell things online, and they didn't have the education. So they were trying to sell things online before there was user-assisted and education regarding the blowback a seller can expect to see <laughs> and the losses a seller can expect to see um, if she, he or she isn't blindingly aware of how damaged it can be not to have a sensible return policy in place before you start selling something <laughs> that's in line with your margins. I know of, and have heard of one guy that admits that he was literally went bankrupt in the 1990s and had to go back to living in his car because he didn't understand the relationship of his profit margin to his return policy, and he freely admits it. Well, why? And I'm not, I'm not bagging on him. He, he admits it himself, because he was trying to use a tool he didn't understand. That's why it's so important before we start talking about investing and trading, that if you're going to use this as a tool, and even discuss it as how it could be used as a tool, you better understand the capabilities of the tool. Like, what's it even intended to do? I I have to reiterate and emphasize for folks who may be younger, when the internet was first developed, there was a long, and I'm going to talk more about this, uh, this idea, but when the internet came along and really exploded, began exploding in 1994, you just had a tool and there wasn't a lot of education that many take for granted as base underlying common knowledge and began to use the tool and hurt themselves. So what I just said was a case example of that. They had this new tool thing, the internet. There was not, and if you're younger, it, it might be a little bit hard for you to conceptualize this. However, many of the things that people understand, if they go to start an online store or any store or anything about having a sensible return policy, there was nowhere to go research that information. You just had a tool, and ones, as I said, would try to set up a site, did not have that base underlying information, would use the tool, and hurt themselves. Because without that information, they set something up, they were returning so many products, that as I said, the one gentleman, wildly successful now, freely admits that he, had, he was living in his car because his return policy was insensible to his margins. You have to know how to use the tool, but not just use the tool. It has to be incorporated with other knowledge that you already possess. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, I can think of other folks, and I... I love, okay, I'll just use name, some names here, but I love Jocko Willing to death. I listen to every podcast the guy puts out. Four-hour, five-hour podcast. By the way, uh, he'll never hear this. He, who, he doesn't know who I am. But it's like, Jocko, where's the rest of the Civil War stuff? I'm a, a ridiculous hist history guy. And by the way, your Civil War guy is from my hometown. 
So I want to, like, you ended with, like, we haven't got to the Battle of the Wilderness or anything. So, like, come on, we just finished Gettysburg. Where's the rest of it, right? So I, I, that's all to say I love Jocko Willing's stuff to death. I listen to everything he puts out. But they had this thing on AI, he and Echo. And eh, for somebody that's done a little bit of research on AI, it was a bit cringe. Because they were making the mistake that I just referred to. Like, they asked the AI, what are some criticisms of Jocko Willing's, like, teachings? And then when the AI gave it answers, they were saying, see, that's wrong. See, the AI got it wrong. No, the AI got it right. You didn't ask the AI. Like, it's like computer language, right? Garbage in, garbage out. If you ask the AI what are criticisms, it's going to tell you what the criticisms are. It's not going to tell you whether or not those criticisms are valid. But it was it was a little bit cringe, a little bit, because it was like, no, they, they went on for like, a long time talking about how AI is so wrong here. Like, I don't say that. I don't say that. I agree. I, I fully agree. Jocko Willink doesn't say that. If you listen to anything that Jocko Willink ever puts out, the criticisms that the AI spit out, Jocko doesn't say that. But people who are ill-educated about Jocko say that about Jocko. And so the AI was giving the correct answer. So that is simply an illustration, a little bit of a story to tell you that you have to think about the questions you're asking it. And you have to have, I'm not saying this about Jocko's education whatsoever because he's a highly intelligent individual. But what I'm saying is I've seen other people, right? Um, and here's where I'm talking about a lack of education, not Jocko, but that's just one case example. But <laughs> my buddy showed me this the other day. And I was like, oh my God. Somebody took ChatGPT and said, uh, hey, give us Chairman Powell's speech, Federal Reserve speech, in Gen Z slang. And it was like, yo, boys, we got you. We keep these ro rates flat for now, yo. But you know, and it was like, he was like, why in the heck would anybody do this? And the answer is nobody with any intelligence would. So when I say people that lack a certain education level, aren't going to know how to use AI. That's what I'm talking about. That, like, asking to put Chairman Powell's speech into Gen Z slang, while it is an excellent demonstration of the stylometry analysis capabilities of artificial intelligence, it's, it's a stupid question. It's, a, it's the equivalent of going up to your computer and typing boobies, boobies, like over and over again on the computer and pointing at it and laughing, going, ah, see what I made the computer say? I made the computer say boobies. It was like, yeah, okay, great. You, you, have, you have a tool that's more powerful than the entire 1960s and 1970s NASA space program, and you did the equivalent of type boobies on it. Like, seriously? Really? <laughs> so I, I do believe that's all to say that one of my conclusions is you have to know and have the educational level and to know how to sift through research material. If you have that, it is a phenomenal research assistant. Uh, ChatGPT, for privacy reasons, it's frustrating, right? I'm going to tell you, I have not changed from the last you heard me from six years ago. I still want my Cylon. We're going to get them. That's going to have a macroeconomic impact. But for there's a current dilemma in artificial intelligence, right? That the thing could figure you out so fast that we are only going to let artificial intelligence remember about seven to eight sessions and questions and queries back and forth. And this is something else I tested about, like, about you. And after that, it, it will erase everything. It won't remember anything. But now some of that, so it can't figure out too much for about you. And for privacy reasons, right? I found that to be assuring and very limiting when I was trying to use the tool. It's like, hey, you remember yesterday when, I don't know who you are. What are you talking about yesterday? Like you can't reference things from yesterday when you're interacting with it. 
There are some AIs that can. But these are all split up into different modules, and to find the perfect module of what you're looking for is very, very difficult at this point. So, and that's just large language, right? I also did a little experiment. I have had a crash course into, uh, man, I've got more to say on this in the future. You, you don't even know. Uh, about quantitative trading and testing and analysis, both from a, somebody I consider a friend of mine now and, um, and my own research and study and re looking at papers and listening to mathematicians on the subject. It's funny because other people is like, yeah, Dan's one of those quant guys. And it's like, I wouldn't consider myself that way. And it's like, do you use quant processes in your trading? Well, yeah, that's a quantitative process. So do you consider yourself a quant? Well, I can tell you what this, my friend uh, that I do anything for, and he's, I, I, I'll put you at a Chucky level. Uh, if I call myself a quant, he's going to roll his eyes. <laughs> but you use quant processes that you developed. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very, very tricky field. You get into that, right? So that disclaimer being said, uh, I'm just trying to sit here and think how to say this. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. This is something that's known, and he would agree with me on, and I hope you don't roll your eyes, brother. <laughs> in quant, quantitative analysis, right, or in, quant, there, in, in a quant team, there's usually a mad scientist, as it has been explained to me by others, and there are, and, I, and I've encountered these people. And I, I don't mean just one individual. I've met uh, several. Some of them are public. Some of them I've interacted with uh, that are mathematicians and coders of quant processes. And those can be split into two different teams, right? So you have your mathematicians in quantitative finance, and they can code stuff. But generally, they're getting their, like, weird mad scientist like hypotheses from people that are traders so you have like your mad scientist team and you have your like coding team and the mad scientist is like hey i got a crazy idea for a trading program i want you to code me up this and put this much slippage in and run a monte carlo and run this and run that and i want to see what that looks like and the coder comes back and is like yeah that's crap <laughs> if you didn't give it any slippage it's crap right but there that's all to say there's two teams okay so you could put me more in the mad scientist type of, uh, you know, when it comes to quant. I know trading, and I know what I would want to see coded, okay? So we'll put it that way. And I've interacted with uh, highly developed mathematical uh, quanti folks in quantitative mathematical finance. It's, it, there's like, it's one field with two different teams. That's the way to think about it. You have the, the team or the guy that's the mad scientist, and you have the team that are the coders, the, the quantitative mathematical folks. Um, sorry if you hear me take my glasses off. The old man's getting serious. He's taking his glasses off. Someone I went to school with, uh, actually. Uh, got to interact with him a bit and come to find out that his son uh, graduated U of M in quantitative finance in coding and, and data statistics, right? So sort of a fascinating conversation I got to have there, as well as several other folks. Now, the reason I'm bringing this all up is I've become familiar with several concepts in talking with um, individuals in Chicago, Detroit, uh, Florida, you know, uh, of just the way quantitative finance works. And in my own self-developed programs, I'd call them gray box programs, that I did create. Me, right? Roll your eyes if you want, but I made them. Uh, there's a concept known as... The, the, when it comes to creating a trading program of... Out of sample and in sample data. Okay. So, what you want to do when you generally create a program, and you can even do this by hand, you don't even need coding. It takes a long time if you do it by hand. Oh, dear God, does it take a long time if you do it by hand? Trust you me. <laughs> you don't even know. Uh, but 
you can do it by hand. Whereas you take an idea, you test that idea with in-sample data. It's called in-sample data. So let's just talk, let's take an area where it may not work well, but it doesn't work horrendously. You think the program will work overall. You think it has positive expectancy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little slice of data where it may struggle. And I'm going to run it there. And if it does okay, if it doesn't do horrendously, then I'll put it through another slice of in-sample data. What do we mean by in-sample data? Historical data. Like something that's known. We'll put it through 2015 if it's a trend trading program in equities. We'll put it through, uh, I don't know, 2022, right? 2023 in equities. We'll, we'll put it through that, see how it does. And if we like that historical data in sample, then we'll run it through 50 years of data and then run it in the future and in the future out of sample data. Okay. Well, Dan, why are you giving us this lesson? It's to tell you this. I went to a self-learning AI. And I, and I, as more of a trader that understands intuitively what works and what doesn't, because I'm a professional gambler. All traders are, right? I, a professional gambler is a professional gambler is a professional gambler. And I'm a trader. So I have an intuitive sense of what works and what doesn't. And as well, in the last six years, how to specify in large language, I went to an AI that had both large language module as well as a self-learning module. And this is what I told it. I said, I want a program in finance, a trading program, that can beat the S&P 500 index both in absolute returns as well as on a risk-adjusted basis. I want the drawdown to be uh, much less obviously on a risk, if I'm talking on a risk-adjusted basis in the S&P, but I want it to beat the S&P 500 index in terms of alpha. And I uh, would like to see the codified quantitative uh, instruction set once you understand how this program could be constructed. And I want the rule set in a gray box format. This next part is important. I told it, give me these codified instructions in English. That's all I told it. I can't emphasize that enough. That's all I told it. And then I got to watch the program unfold. And it freaked me the heck out. It went and told me that it was researching rather uh, several Stanford papers on quantitative finance. It told me it was building a program. It ran it. It then decided that, no, that program didn't do what I asked it to do be, to beat the S&P 500 in index as a benchmark. So it went back and learned some more. Then... Now, mind you, what the instructions that I gave it said nothing about out-of-sample and in-sample data. It told me it was learning about in-sample and out-of-sample data. It told me the papers it was reading. Then it told me that it was going to try another program. Then it told me, here's the Python code I'm trying. It spit out the Python. I never told it to use Python. It spit out the Python code to me. Then it was like, it was doing the job of the quantitative finance team, is my point. And it was using terminology and reading research papers from Princeton and Stanford and Oxford and telling me it was doing so and learning about subjects I had never told it I was that it needed to look at. It figured that out for itself. It ran several iterations and said, this is going to take me some time because what I've run through here, here's another code, sped out another Python code to me, still looking for something that meets all of the objectives. This is going to take some time. Do you want for me to continue? And I was like, nah, nah, I'm straight. I'm straight, man. I'm good. You freaked me the heck out. You know, sort of that Seinfeld episode. It was like, come on, Jerry. I thought I could... 
I could rely on you for a little bit of caring and support. It's like, no, I, th- I think you scared me straight. <laughs> so uh, I stopped it. But my point is I was amazed at it didn't go look up and fall into all of the human fallacies that humans often fall into. It went and taught itself quantitative finance, stuff it took me three years to learn, and I was having all of the human failings. It bypassed all of that and was on to the more advanced stuff inside of three minutes. And I was using the poor man's version. So, that all catches us up, right? So, what, what do I think? What are some of my conclusions? I've also been doing a lot of research on the different agents and how these agents don't, you know, you have a large language, you have a self-learning, you have a large language self-learning that doesn't keep track of its sessions, you have a large, uh, you have a self-learning that's not large language that does keep track of sessions. There's all of these modules of AI, right? And the more I investigated and the more I looked at it, Like I said, it still freaks me out. It knew what out-of-sample and in-sample data was and told me that it was running that without me ever telling it what that's what it was. It went and did the research for itself and basically taught itself like a a beginning Princeton course in quantitative finance inside of three minutes. Freaked me out. In learning about all of these different agents, rolling back here just a bit, I think, and I was around for this, so this is what I'm going back to something else I was saying about 10 minutes ago or however many minutes ago it was. I'm an old guy, right? I remember the beginning of the Internet. Heck, I was a little kid running around the 1970s. There was no Internet. I remember when Internet, how many people, how many, comment if you remember this, if you're old like me. Do you remember Telegard BBSs? Do you remember tag BBSs? I remember when the internet was in that infancy. That is like that is like embryotic phase. And I was like, what, 16, 17 at the time? So, you know, I, I was born into a world where there was no internet. I had black and white TV and I was watching 1966 Batman and Robin, happy as a lark. So I remember, that's all to say, I remember... 1994 and the internet I remember the internet in its infancy and I remember its growing pains and from what I have seen of artificial intelligence we are we are at 1994 for artificial intelligence we are in the infancy we are in the baby stages now as I was putting this together, uh, I ran you know some of these concepts with partners, and several partners mentioned to me, "You're going to have to explain that a little more." And I was like, "What? 1994, right?" Uh, everybody my age, everyone that's a Gen X, if I say, "You know, the internet in 1994," you instantly understand what I'm talking about. And it took me some time. At first, I was a little annoyed, right? It's like, no, no, that's a good analogy. And they had to explain to me over and over again, yeah, that's a good analogy. You've reached a stage in life where you have to understand you're older. Shut up. I don't need nobody telling me that. (laughs) But I did. I I remember uh, I've taken many courses on public speaking and rhetoric And I remember courses in my 20s and modules that taught that when you're speaking publicly, that you need to make sure the information and the way you present it is easily understandable by by your audience. And to do that, you need to take into account age variance. And I remember being in my 20s thinking, I don't even know what you mean by that. I just get up there and I just talk. And you know what? It's awesome. And uh, I don't know what you mean by age variance because everybody understands me. Well, now that I'm the old guy, I understand what they meant. (laughs) And it took me a while when they were telling me this. I was like, oh, I get it. I'm the old guy. And when I say 1994 Internet, 
younger folks, and I'm not insulting you, I'm just saying you weren't alive at the time, right? And so let me uh, explain what I mean by uh, we are at, with AI, we are at 1994 internet stage. Uh, very obviously, <clears throat> you can be young and know that's when the internet came about, but you have to understand the context of that statement. If you are younger, mid-20s, you have seen, you, you've only known the internet in one phase. And that phase is a 30-year-old. You only know the internet as a 30-year-old. In 1994, it was like, hey, internet, go out and use it. And none of the tools that you know of, if you're 22, 23, 25, existed. And like I was mentioning before, right? When I, what I was mentioning before is that many businesses actually fell into, it was Bedros, I'll just say it. It was Bedros, and he freely admits it, that he was using the tool without understanding his return policy to profit margins and basically ended up in his car because he's just bleeding money over time. That happened to more than just a single individual. Pets.com, same thing happened. So there was a base underline of knowledge that just wasn't prevalent throughout society. And many big companies, not just individuals, it just wasn't, ha-ha, let's pick on that one guy who did it and ended up in his car. Many large companies fell into that trap because it was a tool. There's so many aspects that you just... I'm not trying to patronize you. I remember when people in their 50s did this to me when I was in my my 20s, and I, I was somewhat insulted. Maybe it was the arrogance of my youth. I was like, oh, come on, man, I can understand. And it's like, I'm not saying you can't understand. What I'm saying is you haven't had the time experience to see the growth of the Internet as a child into its full maturation. Just as a parent watches a child grow up, and that parent knows the child better than the child. Why? Because they've seen the whole process. Those of us in our 50s who are Generation X have seen the maturation process of the Internet from its childhood and know that process in a way younger folks do not. And so when I say AI is at the 1994 stage, I'm talking about the fact that AI is so new and so young, we have not begun to explore the tools that what is coming 5, 10, 15 years down the road will revolutionize this planet as the way the internet did. Take trading. When I started trading, I'm going to give you a little lesson. Some people know this story. When I started trading, a guy brought me, what about trading? There was no Google search. There was no Google at the time. Didn't exist. Well, how'd you find out about trading? A friend of mine really good friend, brought me a book on it and how some people trade this thing called futures. Oh, I was hooked. So how'd you find out more? There was no internet. Well, how did you do charts? There's no internet. So when I realized, hey, you could chart data out on a, and by the way, there's no five-minute charts. There's no one-minute charts. There's no one. There's no internet. So when I figured out you could chart data open, high, low, close, you know what I did? Uh, there was this thing called commodity price charts. It was a uh, white, black and white like sort of uh, newspaper-like, but it wasn't really the size of a newspaper. It was printed on better quality paper that they could mail to you. And I would get the bi-monthly mailing to me and it's like oh my commodity price charts have arrived in snail mail there's no email there is no internet and <laughs> and you 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 know get out the paper and you'd fold it out and there would be a chart of like live cattle and so you get your pen and paper and it had little grid marks on the paper and you could mark where the high of the low was of the day, and you filled it in day by day with your straight edge and your pencil or your pen on a piece of paper. There is no internet. Well, how did you do orders? Again, there is no internet. I know I'm getting redundant, and that's but you, what I'm trying to impress upon you is if you're younger, it's hard for you to conceptualize just how much the internet surrounds you 
every day and facilitates your life. To get an order, you had to find a broker. How did you find a broker? There is no internet. You're going to get sick of me saying that. So, you know, let your fingers do the walking. Does that phrase even mean anything anymore? So my wife told me this the other day. She was like, have you ever noticed on your phone, it's the image of a phone when you go to answer it. But those phones don't exist on the wall anymore. Like, why isn't it a square rectangle? I was like, you know what? You're right. When you go to answer your phone, it's like a little green. What? It's the symbol of the old hand receiver we used to have. Young people aren't going to know what that is. But anyways, going back, these books I read would develop business deals with the various brokers. The brokers were spread all throughout the country. I had a guy, Mark. He was actually a very good broker out in Oregon. Uh, And I knew Scott. Uh, uh, Scott worked on the floor, actually. Scott wrote a couple of books since. I developed a pretty good relationship with Scott. I've, I've lost track of him over the years. And you would find out, oh, this is a broker. I can, I can call and say, I want to open an account. And you called him on the phone and you talked to him and he talked to you. Or if there was one in your metro area, you could go down to their office and they would talk to you. And they would give you account forms and you filled them in with pen and paper. There is no internet. There's nothing to fill out online. There's nothing to digitally sign. You mail it back. Uh, and then they give you a call. Your account's open. Send us a written check. Or you can wire it. You can go down to your bank and wire it. And uh, then the funds are there. And then what happens when you want to place an order? Well, you call up your broker on the phone and you say, I want to place an order. And you tell them what the order functionality is. And they try to figure out what you are even saying because you're so new. (laughs) And you don't know where the market's at, by the way. You had to pay for the privilege. Just like HFT has tightened our spreads and has paid, I don't know, how much it costs to set up an HFT firm. We'll have more to say that on the in the future. Uh, but just, like, they've paid for that privilege? Well, people play, paid for the privilege of being close to the market and what it was by being on the floor of the various exchanges. You didn't know what the price was at that moment. There was no internet. You had the previous high days range, and you had to make your decisions based on that, and you called in your order... And then you just waited, and there's no internet. I remember, so to look up what the price is, I remember a time when my broker got this thing where you would call the number of this feature that they had on your touch-tone phone. Rotary was still around, but if you had a touch-tone phone, you would call in this feature. I can tell you this for a fact. My wife hated this because I did it. I checked it all the time. And you would in like 1-800, and you had codes that you would press in on the touchtone portion for the different commodity futures or futures that you were trading, the contract months, the the date of, you know, it was June uh, of like 95, right? And you would you would type that in on the touchtone phone. By the way, now there is an internet. So now there is an internet, but nobody knew how to incorporate the various tools that we had. We were still using 1-800 a quote line and dee, 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 and and typing in the little code and it would tell you you know June live cattle trading at and it would give you a price and that actually wasn't the real price and I cannot overemphasize to you how much this absolutely drove my wife completely crazy now we just look down and there is an internet at this time and now we just look down on our phone, pull up our app, scroll, re, you know, maybe hit a refresh, get the price, right? But I was running off. We'd be on vacation. And it was like, I got to find a phone. A touch. Now that phone's no good. I, gotta, I need a touch tone phone. My wife would just sit and be sitting there rolling her eyes. As I'm putting the concepts together for this podcast, she was like, oh my God, that stupid quote line. I hated that thing. <laughs> but anyways, as, as I was saying, I, I would press in the number. Uh, and, you know, June live cattle futures, you know, 97 trading at, and they give you the price. And that actually wasn't the price, as I was saying. Because there was such a delay in information from off of the floor to when, whenever somebody updated that particular module. It may have been three hours ago. And the, the actual mark, the, the bid and the ask is in a completely different area now. But the most recent information this little quote line had, and now there is an internet, 
But everybody's still using this quote line for like four years. 1997, 1998, there's still this quote line because although the infinite internet is in its infancy, it's still maturing. And ones were thinking, man, could we do something like that? And ones were like, you know what? We might be able to. We might be able to. I remember in 1999, 2000, 2001, there was the idea of no longer, and now mind you, there is an internet. There was the idea of, you know what? Maybe not getting these commodity price charts. Create an Excel spreadsheet and enter the data in on your Excel spreadsheet, and then you can see a chart. And if you keep track of it at maybe twice during the day, you can even update the chart during the day and see how the market's moving intraday. Whoa. And I'm going to really blow some of you younger folks' minds. You know, f- people did trade without any charts whatsoever before this age of Internet that we have where so much has been charted now. And I'm talking before XTrader and any of that. People did trade without charts whatsoever. They didn't have any visual thing. As a matter of fact, talk to anyone that traded on the floor. There were no charts. What what do you think? They're standing around and they didn't need a chart. You still don't need charts to trade. They were standing around on the floor. What do you think? They they went back outside the, the trading pit and wrote down on commodity price charts what they know just happened? Of course not. Of course not. They know what just happened. They were trading live intuitively. They may, before the beginning of the day, look and they may look up on the boards and see the high low of the day. They had something called floor pivots that actually began back then that you can still actually chart out today that they would take up note of mentally. But it's not like they were trading off of a chart. And many of them, without charts, pulled millions and millions and millions of dollars out of the markets with no visual charts. That's an important lesson. But just getting back here a little bit, uh, you know, there was, while the internet is still existing and still maturing and is three, four, five years old, we're doing things like entering data and, you know, whoa, we're, we're entering data in and putting it in like a couple of times a day and even being able to see things intraday. Now, mind you, there is an internet at this time, but the internet is still maturing and we hadn't figured out what we have now. And it is a maturation process. There was more to it. There was no Wikipedia. There was no instant encyclopedias. We still had paper encyclopedias. I remember going over to my parents' house, and they had these. And I remember it was sort of like a status thing back in the 80s, that they had bought us encyclopedias where you would go look up information. The Internet came along, and you were still using the paper encyclopedias because the Internet internet, Internet is in this maturation process. It was like six years later before anybody thought of Wikipedia. I remember I was playing, uh, I was like in my mid-20s, and I would still, I was at the time still playing these MMO games, right, that were out at the time. I remember hearing a guy talk about like something he looked up on Wikipedia, and I think, what's that? And he would tell me about Wikipedia, and it's like, whoa, are you saying that they may have enough space out there? I, I know this sounds weird. They may have enough space out there to store all that information. And I may not need to go to the paper encyclopedias. That was 2001. The internet is maturing. This is all to say there's been a maturation process that if you're younger, you may not know. And so when I say 1994 internet, I'm referring to the embryonic stage. The tool has just been born and six years may pass and we'll still be doing things that in 30 years people would laugh at, even though there is artificial intelligence. Again, it's because when I when I first presented these concepts to several partners, they were like, yeah, you're going to have to explain what you mean by 1994 Internet. What I mean by that is artificial intelligence is in its infancy and what it will be doing five years from now will be so much more advanced than now. And 15 years from now, we'll make what comes five years from now look stupid. We are in the sheer infancy, as in the baby has just been born. That's one of my conclusions. The second of my conclusions, as I already said, as we wrap this podcast up, and I'm just going to get to my conclusions here and, and the future for what it means, is... Um, we're in the 1994 baby stages. 
Uh, you have to know how to use it. I mean, it can freak you out. And trust me, AI has freaked me out when I got to the self-learning stuff and modules and the self-learning large language models. It freaked me right out. But you still have to know how to ask the question in order for it to go do the thing. You have to be advanced enough to know what a risk-adjusted basis return is. That you want to see sharps or sortinos at a certain level. What's a sharp and a sortino? See, you don't know to ask the AI that, so therefore, you know. Oh, okay, then I'll ask, if, is a sortino X of good? Okay, I'll ask it for that. Well, you don't know trading well enough to know that that sortino is impossible. And mind you, I've seen sortinos in the fives, the eights, and the threes. So I've seen very high sortinos. But if you don't know what's mathematically possible and how risk-free rates and the arguments over risk-free rates and what should be used as a risk-free rates and how everybody cheats on that. If you don't know those nuances, you're not going to know how to phrase the question properly. So it's still dependent on the human. We have not reached AI singularity. Okay, where the AI knows, ah, this stupid human doesn't know that it needs an, you know, an RFR of four, it still needs a Sortino of three. You know, over a 10-year time frame with variable adjustable RFR. Like, you have to know how to ask it that. We haven't reached the point yet where the AI knows it. But that day is coming. So... First thing is, we're in the 1994 baby stages. You have to know the questions and the nuances. At this stage, we are in the game. And I'm on the lookout for the where you don't need to know these questions. It's one of the things I'm looking at in the future. But you have to know the nuances of, of your field. Or it's, it's a tool at this point. It's not the master. I would also say any of these videos you see of anthropomorphizing AI where the face gets angry. Oh, look, the face got angry. The face was programmed to get angry, right? It's not consciousness. It's not self-awareness. It's thinking and reasoning, which are different scientific mechanisms that many of us who have studied sort of metaphysical topics would argue are wildly different than, than being self-aware. Uh, so, you know, that's my other thing. You know, we're in the beginning phases, 1994. Uh, don't let the anthropomorphize, like, big headline-grabbing asteroid heading for Earth-type crap scare you. There are some things to be afraid of of AI. I do agree, like, what if the AI... Why are we not discussing the implementation of Asimov's three rules of anything that has executable self-learning power? Why aren't we talking about that implement asimov's three robotics laws into ai for anything that is self-learning and can self-execute a command period end of story you do that you have greatly negated the danger that AI could decide, hey, you know what? I'm trying to pave this road, so let's just get rid of humans. And uh, I can self-execute commands, so let's just do that. <laughs> and I, I figured out how to do it. Uh, yeah, you, you, don't want, you don't want AI. AI is not going to be self-aware Skynet. Ooh, I'm a self-conscious being, and humans are going to unplug me. You don't need that. You need to worry about the fact that it's trying to pave a road and has figured out that maybe humans are in the way, and they're this thing, and I need to get rid of them. Implement Asimov's three laws, make it law, make it regulation in anything that is self-learning and can self-execute. Period. End of story. There's no debate about that. Uh, I have no idea why that hasn't been at the topic of every AI conversation. Other anthropomorphizing, I wouldn't. It's just people, oh, look, it got angry. No, it didn't get angry. It's, it's scraping the internet for information to show you anger because it thinks that in a large language model way, it can interact with you in that way. That's not the danger. 
the dangers, the self-executing, uh, self-learning stuff, solving problems. That's the danger. And there, it is a danger. So I, I, w- I will say that. We're in the beginning phases, as I said. Impact on markets, I think, and macroeconomics. Let me finish up with this. I think that staff is going to be greatly reduced in many fields, not just finance. What do you need a huge staff for when the AI can do it? Especially if we're in the 1994 phase and people are saying we're going to reach AI singularity in five years. Every time I say that, I think of that line from Jurassic Park where he's pounding on the table, right? He's talking to Ian. He's like, oh, but our scientists have told us we can. Yeah, but the problem is, is that you, while you were just so busy figuring out how to do it, like you just figured up how to like sell it and package it and put it together. And it, rather than figure out that your scientists you know, could do this, you never stop to think if your scientists should to do this. You never stop to consider, should we do this? You know, I want to see Oppenheimer, by the way, as far as a movie on that topic. Uh, so it's coming. AI singularity from everybody I've talked to, it's coming. Uh, staff is going to be greatly reduced. And impact on markets. Here's, here's what I, how I explained it to a business partner. Here's what I think. Uh, and I'll even get you a little bit of homework here. If you don't know what the Pareto distribution is, I would suggest that you do a little bit of, like, go listen to a podcast on the Pareto distribution. It's quite fascinating. The Pareto distribution will remain in effect with the top firms, uh, being, staying the top firms. They're just going to stay at the top firms. Why? Because of the Pareto distribution. The Pareto distribution just isn't about wealth. It's not about the way capital is, uh, you know, distributed in society. The Pareto distribution is found throughout the universe and like everything. By the way, you want to talk about the abundance of life throughout the universe? I think you need to look at the Pareto distribution. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty special. Uh, it's found in everything. It's not just in the way wealth is distributed within a society. I heard um, the same doctor mention this previously, and I, and I thought a brilliant way to put it, right? You look back in, like, ancient, like, the Ublaid cultures of, like, Mesopotamia before Sumeria ever existed, right? You find a guy decked out in gold, like, in every kind of ornate burial, and they all poor sucker next to him. He's got, like his own hip bone that he's clutching, and that's it. <laughs> it's in everything. It's, it's in class. It's in structure. It's in wealth. It's in life. I mean, this, from what we can see in the universe around us, we've, I mean, honestly, as far as the Drake equation, we ain't heard nothing. So it seems to apply to life. It applies not to simply wealth and money. It applies to everything. So as far as the Pareto distribution, I think you're not going to see any difference. I think the top firms will remain the top firms, earning the top money. Not because, oh, you know, well, yeah, they are. They can be scummy. I'm sorry. I've seen a little bit more of finance in the last seven years. They can, they can, they can act like scumbags. Uh, but that isn't why. It's the Pareto distribution. And you're going to see the same thing in AI. So I think there may be some shifts in firms because of AI. And I think we may see some disruptions uh, which are always, I think, a good thing, or can be a good thing. No, they can't. They aren't always good things. Sometimes they're bad. <laughs> I thought about me wanting to go see Oppenheimer. I'm like, no, nah, disruptions are not always a good thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, the Pareto distribution is going to remain in effect. Uh, staff is going to be much less needed. Here's the question me and a business partner had. In order to solve for trading, right, I heard an excellent discussion with Eric Weinstein, and I know he's been discussing, he's not a physicist, but on a mathematical basis, he's been discussing his, uh, what is it, uh, geometric unity field, you know, for a sort of a, from what I understand, I tried to listen to his dissertation on it, on unified field theory. Uh, He mentioned something, and I had to laugh, because I've heard several people and several firms say this, of how many of us 
If there is a holy grail, the finance has been figured out. And Eric Weinstein was talking about his, you know, uh, what is it, geometric unity for a unified field theory. And he went to talk to another mathematician. He went to talk to Jim Simmons of, Rena- of uh, yeah, Renaissance, right? Yeah. And he's like, I want to show you the math and have you, you know, like obviously the mathematics you're doing here at Renaissance is like so far advanced. And he said, he said, I was very surprised because Jim looked at me and said, if you actually knew what we were doing here, you would be so disappointed. <laughs> and anybody that understands multi-strats in, in larger firms knows exactly why Jim said that, right? So that's all to say that it's not like these, you know, geometric unity Dirac equation and how that folds in on, you know, this equation. That's not quantitative finance. If you think it is, you're wrong. You need a certain humility about the stupid simplicity of what you have to do to create great risk-adjusted return numbers. And humans don't like that. Humans want it like they want to see. No, 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 no. That I can't be that simple. It's got to be this. It's got to be, you know, how Dirac's equation folds in on this new subspace theory to like, no. No, it's not. It's actually quite simple and you need, you know what you need to really see it? You need humility. Now the question is, is humility simplicity? Is humility saying, no, I've been trying to overcomplicate this? And in actual actuality to solve and g- create great risk-adjusted return numbers, incredible alpha with very low drawdowns, I need the humility to see that the answer is actually very simple. Here's my question, and I don't know the answer to it, and maybe you all can discuss it in the comments of this podcast. Is humility to see that answer simplicity? And without human failings, will AI be able to solve that? And you just ask it the question, and it can bypass all of the junk that you do in trading. That's self-sabotaging. I won't say do it for you in a black box manner. But I don't know. Maybe in 15 years it can. That's the great question. I think... I. But, but to me, the answer to that question I come back to is that you have to know how to ask the questions. You have to know how to phrase the questions. And if you don't, then all the AI in the world is not going to help you. I don't know if you could phrase the question well enough. Then, I don't know, maybe AI could come up with a program and, and, and demonstrate to you, you know, some of the programs I've seen that are just, just produce insane alpha with very low drawdowns. I don't know. I don't know. Here's another geometric, I, I won't say prediction, but or geometric. Uh, I've been thinking about too much Eric Weinstein as of late. To, uh, here's a question I have along the lines of um, macroeconomics. They're already talking about putting several module AIs that are large language self-learning into advanced robotics. And so I'm talking like, again, we're in the 1994 of AI, folks. If you think we're so advanced, this is just the beginning. We haven't gotten to like six years from now when it gets nutty and there's just put artificial intelligence on anything and it just goes through the roof. That's going to tie into some some of the topic of my next podcast on valuations. Um, 
because I got a lot to say about valuations in this environment. That's coming up in a future podcast, as well as interviews, we hope. But my my point is, it's like we're we're still in the baby stages. So what happens when in 15 years time, all of these modules of large language of self-learning, something instituted with Asimov's three laws and life has imitated art. And you've got AI and robots that are self-learning and something like a Boston Dynamics robot. I'll tell you what it means. It means I'll finally get my Cylon. You know, but I've joked about that over the course of many years. But what are the... uh, the macroeconomic impacts of that? I despise the concept of universal income, but will that become necessity? I'm not predicting that. I'm asking the question. If you've got AI robots that can stock shelves and you don't need overnight stock shelves, you know, they don't need health care. You know, people are all upset about self-checkouts. Oh, what about the cashiers? What about their jobs? <laughs> That's just the beginning what happens when you put a self-learning AI robot with, you know, with several modules in it, with Asimov's three laws, into something that can stock shelves, and it doesn't have to work eight hours, it can work 24, or until its charge wears out, and its buddies, when it goes back to charge, will come out and continue to stock the shelves. You don't need shelf stockers anymore. Sorry, you're out of a job as well as the cashiers, you do, I don't know, just trying to think of jobs here. You do loading work at a warehouse in a high-low. Sorry, bye. AI robot can do it. You need, I don't know, again, I'm just sitting here thinking of jobs. They're already testing, and I could tell you in my city, they've got AI robots uh, that deliver food to... um, a certain section of the city. And we're in the 1994 of AI. Oh, there's tons of problems. Things it's hung up on all sorts of stuff. But we're in the 1994 of AI. It will improve. You think I'm being overly dramatic? Go take a look at what Boston Dynamics can have their robotics do and then think about an AI inside of that. So my question on a macroeconomic level is in 15, 20 years, this becomes more advanced. What does that do with employment on, on just a global macroeconomic level? I despise the idea of universal income. But at what point does that become necessity if an AI Cylon can do the whole thing? Then you got to figure... Uh, how do we decide in that whole universal income thing if AI can do everything? Gee, what what social economic strata are you in? So how much should you get? Humans, we rush into solutions. This is something I've often said. Humans are the universe's engineers. We can engineer anything. We can send we can send something the size of a piano to a small planetoid to take HD pictures of it six billion miles away, get within the exact distance that we want to get, take absolutely incredible HD images, and send them back to us. There's this phrase in the Bible where... where uh, I know many doctors and others have talked about the concept that, like, you know, the Tower of Babel problem as a as a metaphoric problem, right? We can engineer this thing. Well, should you? Is that to the best interest of where you are in this stage of society, right? Humans never think that way. But can we engineer it? Oh, heck yeah, baby. We can engineer the heck out of anything. <laughs> But we just we lack the capability of seeing far enough advanced to what problems that could cause. I see a lot of problems that AI will cause. Huge disruptor and good in some ways, an excellent tool for us, but the questions it raises, you know, does is simplicity humility, therefore can it solve the trading problem and get humans out of their own way? 
You know, we are, I do believe, in the 1994 of AI. What will it do if we put it in robots like Boston Dynamics and let it do the tasks that only humans can do at this point? What will that do to the income capability? I mean, it'd be do wonderful things. You can't only look at the bad. You got to look at both sides of it. Right. What is what is debt? of an economy. People think, oh, our, our children are enslaved to that. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. Anybody wants to debate me, I, I will happily embarrass them. Your children are not indebted. The economy is indebted on a productivity basis as a lean against the future, yes. But it's not like that debt is collected from taxes or something that your children have to pay back. It's It's a productivity lean known on based on how productive that economy is considered. So you do let, so on the good side of it, you know, it, productivity through the roof. Great, wonderful. What about all the people that need to make the money to buy the stuff? These are the questions I have when I think about AI, when I think about trading, when I think about, I don't think the Pareto distribution can be ignored, when I think that AI is in basically 1994 stages. It's that that you still have to know how to use it, right? You still have to know the questions to ask. Those are the conclusions that I have come to. I mean, you can research and go through all of this stuff yourself that I've mentioned, and I would encourage you to do so. It's what you should do. Because at the end of it, when I discuss this tool of artificial intelligence and the conclusions I've come to about it, the questions I have about the future, the concerns, as well as you know the good points for the future, well, it's been what it's always been. And people who know me know where I'm going. It's been what it's always been. It's simply been our thoughts, not yours. And our thoughts are just good until they're canceled. For whatever the heck day it is, as always, stay safe, trade well, and remember that love doesn't cost a dime.